Many blessings to you. My name is Dr. Cesar of Hechos and Homies Empowerment, and this is part of our ethnic studies learning community and story time. We have one of the most powerful stories that I've ever read, and I'm so excited to share it with you. It is called Mendes versus Westminster. This particular book is written by Michael Matsuda and Sandra Robbie. Sandra also made a PBS documentary about this case, and it's illustrated by Elazar Martinez. Oh, I can't wait to get into it. Let's check it out. Take a look at this image. This is an image of young Silvia. Eight-year-old Silvia Mendez had long dark braids and was the oldest child of Gonzalo and Felicitas, two hardworking farmers. The Mendez family had just moved to a town called Westminster in Orange County, California. They lived on a farm with neat rows of asparagus, chiles, and tomatoes. The year was 1943. Silvia was excited about signing up for her new school. She liked school. She liked playing the teacher and helping her younger brothers with their homework. I want to be a nurse when I grow up, she said. Silvia was a happy student. Take a look at this image. This is an image of the students trying to go sign up for school. And what made the idea of going to her new school more fun was that it was the very same school her father had attended when he was little. But when Silvia arrived at the school to sign up with her cousins, they discovered something had changed. The school officially told her aunt Sally that the Mendes children were not welcome. Ms. Viduri, said the school representative, your children may attend this school, but your brother's children cannot. They have to go to the Mexican school. But why, asked Aunt Sally, why will you take my children and not my brother's children? Your brother's children are Mexican. They have to go to the Mexican school, the representative sternly repeated. Can you imagine that? All you want to do is go to school. All you want to do is learn. And then they have the nerve to tell you, you can't go here just because of the color of the skin and because of who you are. Mm. Here you see the family gathering at home with mom and dad. Silvia's aunt Sally had married a Mexican man who was part French so her children, Alice and Virginia, had light hair and skin. And though they were Mexican-American, they had a French last name, Viduri. Silvia's father, Gonzalo, was born in Mexico. Her mother, Felicitas, was born in Puerto Rico. Silvia and her brothers, Jerome and Gonzalo Jr., had inherited their parents' dark hair and skin. It's a blessing. And though they were all born in America, here in the U.S., and they spoke English, they had a Mexican last name, Mendez. If you won't take my brother's children, then my children will not stay, said Aunt Sally firmly. She quickly gathered up all the children, and they went silently back to the farm. That takes a lot of courage for Aunt Sally to not just to think about her own kids, but to think about her nieces and nephews and to say, nah, an injustice to one is an injustice to all. Shout out to Aunt Sally. When Aunt Sally told Mr. Mendes what happened, Mr. Mendes was worried that Sylvia wouldn't be able to go to college. The only school that would take the Mendes children was completely run down. It did not have new books or swings or even a good reputation for academics. Mr. Mendes sighed. He talked to his wife. Mommy, 
What are we to do? Our children cannot go to the good school right across the street. They won't let the Mexicans attend. This is the school that they want them to go to called Hoover. Quote unquote, the Mexican school. Felicitas put her arm around Sylvia. That's not right, mija. Hoover School, where the Mexican children go, is really run down. No supplies, no books, no hope for these children. Mr. Mendez looked straight into Sylvia and Gonzalo Jr.'s eyes and said, This is America, and we are Americans. You deserve what all children deserve. I'm going to go talk to that principal tomorrow. Shout out to Dad. Thank you, Dad, for not being afraid to speak out. Here you see dad literally coming into the principal's office. The next day, Mr. Mendez went to see the principal of 17th Street School. I'm sorry, Mr. Mendez, but your children cannot attend our school. They are of Mexican heritage. We do not allow Mexicans, Africans, or Asian children into our schools. It's not up to me, it's the law. Then dad says, then we must change the law. Oh. Here you see mom and dad probably strategizing, figuring out what they're going to do. By the time he got home, dad cooled off a bit. But then he started thinking, we're lucky to have rented this farm, Felicitas. We have money to hire a lawyer. You know what? We're going to sue this government and change the law. Oh, imagine the power to make that decision. Wow. Mm. This is a heavy image. It's a heavy image of a concentration camp where a lot of Japanese Americans were rounding it up. This is the time of World War II and the U.S. declared Japan an enemy country and they rounded up a bunch of people and threw them into these concentration camps, into these prisons. And even though the U.S. was also at war with Germany, they never set up concentration camps for Germans because Germans are white and Japanese are not. It was racism that rounded up our Japanese American sisters and brothers. Criminal. The Mendeses had rented the farm from another family. Mr. and Mrs. Munemitsu. They were Japanese Americans, and because the U.S. was at war with Japan, Japanese Americans were placed in internment camps far away from home, far away from Westminster. Huh. Check out this image. Let's find out what it's about. Sylvia knew the Munemitsus had twin daughters and sometimes thought about them playing on the farm, the farm that they now rent. Sylvia was saddened that the Munamitsus were taken away. It is okay, Sylvia, Miss Mendez said gently. We will keep the farm in good shape so when the Munamitsus return, they'll be happy to see that we did a good job. It looks like that's dad, and it looks like he's meeting a lawyer trying to hire someone that's going to really step up. In the next few months, Mr. Mendez searched for a lawyer who would represent them in trying to change the law so his kids could go to the school across the street. Finally, they found a lawyer named David Marcus. You might be wondering why is there an image of a swimming pool? But if you notice, that swimming pool has whites, black, brown, different ethnic groups and racial groups all swimming together. There's a reason for that. Mr. Marcus had helped Mexican-American families in San Bernardino who wanted to use the public parks and swimming pools. Mr. Marcus told Mr. Mendez about the city that tried to keep so-called minorities from using the public pool. By the way, I don't use that word minorities. We are not less than or equal, nah. That's just the, the words that are given to us. But we don't have to accept them. 
Because of their darker skin color, Mexicans, Asians, and African Americans were considered too dirty to use the same pools as white people. Can you imagine that? We won that one, smiled David Marcus. I'm glad to have you as my lawyer, said Gonzalo as they shook hands. Shout out to Mr. Marcus and lawyers like him. Thank you for standing up for what is right. You know, it wasn't just the Mendez family that was brave. All of a sudden, more families stand up and are not afraid to sue this government. Take a look at this image. Check this out. Mr. Marcus said that it would be good if they could find more families who would step forward from other school districts. The Lorenzo Ramirez family, the Frank Palomino family, and the William Guzman and Tomas Estrada families all quickly joined Mr. Mendez and his efforts. Salute to all of these families. The lawsuit was called Mendez versus Westminster School District and represented 5,000 students of Mexican heritage. No que no, of course the people fight back and of course we win. As soon as they started to fight back, here comes the superintendent. Superintendent shows up and tries to speak to dad. Check it out. Once the Westminster School District found out about the lawsuit, the superintendent asked to meet Mr. Mendez. We have decided to let your children attend the 17th Street School, the superintendent smiled. All you have to do is drop the lawsuit. Ooh. What do you do? What would you do? Now they're going to let your children in go to the good school. Do you drop the lawsuit? Let's find out. You want us to stop? And we can send our children to the good school? Mr. Mendez was surprised. For a moment, Gonzalo was feeling happy. But what about the other children? The superintendent frowned. What others? The other Latino children. Can they also attend a school of their choice? That would be impossible. Everyone would want to leave the poor schools. <laughs> I can't believe he admitted that he's got poor schools. See, we have a lot of school districts today that have poor schools, even in my city, but we don't always want to admit it. Then I'm sorry, said Mr. Mendez. Don't be so stubborn. You will not win this case, said the superintendent sternly. Oh, the power of dad. And listen to what dad uses as evidence of why he needs to fight. Check out this image. Mr. Mendez said to the superintendent, every day my children say the Pledge of Allegiance. At the very end it says, liberty and justice for all. This is really about justice for all children. Mr. Superintendent, goodbye. Whoo! That's like a check, man. Respects to dad. And then here comes the family coming back together to strategize some more. Gonzalo was angry after this meeting. Imagine the nerve of them asking us to stop the lawsuit and sacrifice 5,000 children and what we're fighting for. Papi, you are very brave. We love you and mommy so much, Silvia cried. They found that they were not alone. Oh, this is beautiful. Look at who's stepping up. Two young African-American lawyers learned about the Mendez case and wrote a supporting argument. They were from a civil rights group called the NAACP. Their names were Robert Carter and Thurgood Marshall. And they would later represent African-American families in a lawsuit called Brown versus the Board of Education. Talk about solidarity, man, living on a Japanese-American farm. Mexican and Puerto Rican families united with civil rights lawyer, with African-American lawyers from NAACP. Whoo, the people are uniting and it's not over. Take a look. 
other groups joined in to lend support, including the Japanese American Citizens League, the American Jewish Congress, and the American Civil Liberties Union, or ACLU. This support gave Gonzalo and Felicitas hope. David Marcus, the lawyer, was also really pleased. We have a lot of good people and good organizations helping us. El pueblo unido jamás será vencido. A people united shall never be defeated or divided. Oh, now it's time. You see that little girl in front of the judge. That little girl is actually not Silvia. It was another little girl who was asked to testify. Let's check it out. At last, the trial began and Mr. Marcus had 25 witnesses. Imagine 25 brave people ready to testify. He rose and she rose, brought before the court, including little Sylvia and some of the other children. Sylvia was nervous, but ready. She breathed a sigh of relief when her name was not called to testify. Instead, she watched as another little girl was called in front of the judge. The judge was a gentle man with gray hair and a warm smile. His name was Judge Paul McCormick. And he asked the little girl to place her hand over the Bible and to swear to tell the truth. Can you tell us, do you think you're ready to attend the 17th Street School? Asked the judge. Yes, sir. I get good grades. I study hard and I just know I can do it. The girl nervously beamed. She still lit up represent then you see this heavy image the image of hate see what this is about Sylvia saw many witnesses that day including a professor who said that he believed the practice of segregating children that means separating them by their race was much like what Adolf Hitler and the Nazis did to the Jews and the gypsies during World War II Shout out to that professor for speaking truth to power in a courtroom. And it goes further. Here you have the lawyer, Mr. Marcus, about to take a stand. The school districts also had witnesses and brought forth one superintendent. Listen to this who said that Mexican-American children were not as smart and not as clean as white children. This wasn't just happening in California, in Texas. They had passed laws that Mexican children had to go to first grade for three years in a row until the people of Texas united and organized and fought to change that light, excuse me, that law. But they had the light to fight. He also said that even if they were smart, he would not ever allow them into white schools. Mr. Marcus got angry. He said that the superintendent was like Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. You see, today we have some people that are acting that way too. But we've seen them before. We have fought them before and we have won before and we will win again. Take a look at this image. After two weeks of intense testimony, the judge was ready to announce his verdict. Judge McCormick banged his gavel, and when the courtroom hushed, he spoke, and these are the exact words that he said, and they're on record. I'll show you the image after. The American system of public education must support social equality. It must be open to all children by unified school association, regardless of lineage. I therefore rule in favor of the Mendez family. Bam. Toma. Mr. Marcus grabbed Mr. Mendez and said, we did it for your children. Nah, Mr. Mendez disagreed. And Mr. Mendez said, no, my friend, we didn't do it for my children. We did it for all children. And anybody that's watching right now, the reason 
I get to go to schools in California and I got to go to elementary, middle school, high school, college, university, and all these degrees, including a doctorate. The only reason I have those opportunities is because of wins like this, that desegregated schools. I stand on the shoulders of these giants. Mm. And in some sense, this is the end. What was so powerful about this case is that this case led to the desegregation of all schools in California just two years later. And California became the first state in the nation to desegregate all of their schools. The reason African American, Latino, Asian, Native American, indigenous and white are all able to go to school together in California today is because of Mendez versus Westminster, is because of the Lemon Grove incident, which is another case in the 1930s, is because of Brown versus Board of Education in the 1950s. A people united will not be defeated. What a powerful story. Right now, we're isolated, we're going through this scare, we have a difficult presidency, and what are we gonna do? We're gonna read our history, we're going to remember who we are, where we come from, and we say, and justice for all. My people, it's been an honor to be here with you. Would you please share this? Would you please email us at homiesempowerment at gmail.com and let us know your thoughts about this story? And would you please reach out to Sylvia Mendez? She's still alive, still going strong, an amazing educator. She went on to become a nurse. She did become a nurse, and she worked at USC for over 30 years. She's still going strong. Many blessings to you all.